Welcome back to the second hour of today's Butler on Business. And joining us now is David Morgan of the Morgan Report. David is our precious metals, particularly our silver expert. He's out there in the Pacific Northwest. And during the break, David was telling me that he was a Oakland Raiders fan. David, uh, it was about three or four weeks ago I actually got to spend the evening uh, with, among many other people, uh, Art Shell. Former Raiders, wow. former Raiders wow. head coach. Well, he was being inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame. I was sitting at a table with my dear friend, Philip Fulmer, who was also being inducted that night. And I got to spend probably a good 15 to 20 minutes talking to Coach Shell. What a nice, nice guy. True class act. I would say he was a much better player than a coach, but that's just my opinion. But a class act all the way around. That's fantastic. Well, absolutely. And it and it's you know he's a little older than I am, but it's still hard to imagine that Art Shell could not go to the college of his choice back when he was a college kid, uh, simply because of segregation. But it's uh, it's not a chip on his shoulder. It was just it was just a matter of fact. David, we saw the precious metals come under pressure last week. And then now that we've had a chance to, to look back on it, uh, I think it was either Wednesday or Thursday of last week, somebody dumped 2 million ounces of gold on the market, probably paper gold, at the market. No, nobody in their right mind does that, do they? Well, they're in their right mind, and the reason they're in their right mind is they know. I mean, all markets move on buying or selling pressure. The more buying pressure there is, the higher the price of the commodity or the stock or whatever it is. And the same thing on selling. The more selling pressure there is, if everybody wants to dump a certain stock or commodity or investment, it drives the price down substantially. So the people, especially with that kind of size, have the ability to, have to move that kind of a size order, know exactly what's going to happen. So they could have different accounts of friends uh, or whatever, have massive put positions or whatever, put that sell order into the market, knowing that it's an absolute fact that it's going to drive the price down and drive it down hard. Where exactly it's going to end, they don't know, but they know it's going to take it down. And this has taken place on the precious metals markets time and time again. But I want to be fair. Alan, this happens in other markets. I mean, the working group on financial markets basically saved the 1987 crash after the fact. In other words, uh, they didn't know what to do. And they, meaning the authorities, the government, the powers that be, the SEC, the CFTC, the president of the New York Stock Exchange, at all. So they formed the working group on financial markets, went into the market, and started buying futures on the S&P until it started to move up. Again, buying pressure causes a move up, selling pressure a move down. So it was absolutely a known fact before the event. The problem is that there's no oversight, really. I mean, the regulators are asleep at the – well, I wouldn't say they're asleep at the wheel. I think they're in a complicit situation that they really can't do much or won't do much. Take your choice. It doesn't matter. The end result is the same. They're doing absolutely nothing. And so we're going to witness this again and again. It is all paper. There is no physical transferred net transaction. And because the paper markets dictate the price, we get these huge price swings at times. And, of course, what it really does is it breaks the psychology. Because people that thought, you know, I'm going to buy gold. I've listened to, you know, Mark Faber, Dr. Faber. <clears throat> excuse me. I've listened to Peter Schiff. I've listened to, you know, name your favorite commentator, uh, Gerald Salente. And I decided, you know, gold is really a place I need to put some money. Uh, it's a safe haven. Uh, you know, it goes up in the long term. And then they see this happen, and they get scared out of it. They say, no, you know what, I'm glad I didn't buy gold. Look at what's going on. Things are really pretty bad, but gold's going down. I don't want to touch it. So they've won the psychological battle the last couple of years. And the longer it stays in this trading range or walls around sideways, the more they're actually winning from a psychology point of view. From a fundamental perspective, it's never been better to own gold, and it's a good time because the price really isn't reflective of its true value right now. It's really undervalued from any me metric you want to use. Now, there are others out there who will disagree with me, but you know I'll stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with them on how I come up with my metrics, and they can show me theirs and let the public decide. David, one of the fascinating stories that I'm familiar with, and I'm sure you're an expert on it, is how the Comex uh, moved against the Hunt brothers back during the silver bubble of 1980. Can, can you share that story with us briefly? 
Oh, briefly, yeah. The best book on that was written by Paul Sarnoff, and it's called Silver Bowls. And he goes in and tells you kind of day-by-day, transaction-by-transaction. There were a couple times that the Hunts probably could have taken the Comex down. There was one time, they didn't do just futures. They did the physical metal as well as futures. There was one time when they went for delivery of silver bullion. Well, bullion is defined as the Comex. is 1,000-ounce bars. Now, these are poured bars, and they're stamped with their exact weight because none of them weigh exactly 1,000 ounces, but they're around that number. So they were standing for delivery, and the Comex could not deliver. So that's a default right there way back in the late 70s. But what the Hunts did as nice guys was they said, well, we'll settle for junk silver bags instead. Back then, Alan, you're old enough to remember this, there used to be two uh, markets. There was a bag market and a bullion market on the exchange. And there was an arbitrage going on between the bags and the bullion. I don't know if you remember that or not, but that was the way it worked. So the Hunts basically said, okay, we'll be nice guys. We'll take bags because it's silver, you know, instead of bars. So they did that. And then, of course, the debacle with um, – as it went on, the, the biggest problem, really, in my view, after studying this thing and reading the book a couple times, is that this guy Jarowski, and I don't know if I pronounced his name correctly, was the like the leader of the CFT, uh, of the CME at the time, and he was massively short silver. This is a massive conflict of interest, massive conflict of interest. And so they basically changed the rules and, and made sell orders only. Well, I just said a minute ago, if you sell something, uh, it's going to drive the price down. Well, if you can only sell, what do you think that's going to do to the price? Now, I want to also be fair. There was a meeting here in Spokane years ago, probably now of a decade ago, and, and um, Phil Baker, the CEO of Hecla Mining, put together a consortium of all kinds of silver experts. He brought in the Silver Users Association, the CME, the COMEX, uh, the Silver Institute, uh, major mining companies that mine silver, uh, a lot of people, and I happen to be invited. And the guy from the COMEX got up, and the first words out of his mouth were, we did not change the rules on the Hunt Brothers. We merely enforced the rules that were already established. Now, I couldn't go back and find what the contract read back in those days. Maybe somebody has it. I don't. Uh, nonetheless, the point being that uh, it was a sell side only. They knew what it was going to do. And, again, conflict of interest. So when the CFTC hearing came up, and this same character – comes out of the woodwork and tells the CFTC commission, and he used some uh, Latin term, and I forget the term, but basically it takes great courage to do nothing. Uh, he, he suggested that the, that the COMEX, the authorities, the, the investigation do nothing. And here's a guy that was a total conflict of interest, and he's telling the CFTC years and years and years later, hey, the best thing you can do is to not do anything. So, you know, from a guy that's looked at the silver market basically my entire adult life, you see stuff like that, it just grinds you. You know, it just really gives you a, a bad taste in your mouth. Didn't the Comex offer the Hunt Brothers some money to walk away, and then they decline? And uh, that's when they said, okay, sell only? You know, there's a lot of uh, rumors. I've never seen anything in writing. You can find that uh, you know, that rumor out there, but I actually know one of the trustees for the Hunt Brothers Estate, and he was back there with them then. So some of these things I vet through him. Of course, I'll keep his name anonymous. I have to. But, you know, the longer these stories go, the more embellished they become. Uh, I've asked a couple things that I was pretty sure of that they did or didn't do, only to find out that wasn't true. So I'm trying to stay to the facts as much as possible. My big dream, one of my goals, one of my bucket lists was to interview Bunker before uh, he passed on. But I asked this uh, this friend of mine, I'll call him a friend, and he just said, no, his health is just too bad. He wouldn't do it. Um, and he wouldn't. And I didn't get the interview, but it was a, something I really wanted to do. And that was years ago. And, um, anyway, but it's, it's quite a story. They had a belief system similar to mine. They thought the dollar, the U.S. dollar, not being backed by anything wouldn't last forever. And they also thought the silver was a better investment than gold. And gold at the time they started buying silver uh, was um, not legal to own. Later on it became legal. So during their whole process of the early 70s through the late 70s, or I should say even the 60s perhaps, I forget when they started buying. I don't want to. Uh, mis- mischaracterize this, but regardless, they were both gold and silver owners, particularly silver. He felt, and I'll say this for the record, Bunker felt that the true ratio of, of the gold-silver ratio should be five to one. 
Uh, so that shows you how undervalued he thought silver is. We've been speaking with David Morgan of the Morgan Report. David, briefly, in about 15 seconds, tell him about the Morgan Report. Yeah, let's just uh, get people onto the YouTube channel. That seems the most popular. Just go to Silver Guru on YouTube. Uh, look underneath the videos. There's ways to get on our list to get the Morgan Report for a free trial, 30-day subscription. You just have to click one link, give us a first name and a valid email address, and you can sign up there for 30 days for free. David Morgan, ladies and gentlemen. David, it's always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you very much.